All right, Josh, come on up. Josh is a uh, small group, I always get the name wrong. <laughs> coach, there it is, DLT coach. And uh, he's gonna give us today a little bit of a challenge. I'm not gonna steal his letter, so go right ahead. Josh. Yeah, so this is, uh, thank you, Brian. This is the first chance I've had to uh, give you part of the message. And so I thought maybe I would dress up a little bit, but uh, you know, I started looking through my closet and started realizing most of what I own is red plaid shirts or red polo shirts. You get the idea. I mean, most of you know me by my red, so red it is. So have you guys been struggling with your New Year's resolutions? Yeah, if so, you're not alone. 88% of New Year's resolutions fail. Most of us are aiming for a physical change when we set up these goals. Uh, maybe lose weight, quit smoking, eat healthier. Well, what if we were to set up a resolution and a goal for 2013 that would affect and improve both our physical and our spiritual lives? More importantly, what if we could come up with one we could all stick to? What would that look like? Well, I warn you now, this involves both, both testing God and trusting God. And worse yet, it involves money. Yeah, most of us shut down when we talk about money. Many of us are living paycheck to paycheck. Or are losing sleep thinking about how we're going to pay that big stack of bills. But we can free ourselves from this bondage by taking a look at what God says about money in the Bible. And then applying that to our lives. See, nothing has changed regarding money since Jesus' day. And there are over 2,000 passages that talk about money. If it's that important to God, then he must have a strong message for us. Well, today, we're not going to go through all 2,000 verses. We're going to take a look at a couple verses and see if we can get a vibe for what God intends for us to do with our resources. First, from Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. You may have seen this verse before. We put it up you know, when we do our offerings sometimes. Um, the context is the prophet Malachi chastising the Jews for turning away from God. And in this passage, God is calling us back into a relationship with him by worshiping him through their giving. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. There's that churchy word, tithe. It means to give a tenth part of. If we search the Bible, we find that the number 10 was generally used as a test. Think about it. If we uh, talk about the Ten Commandments, there God's asking us and giving us a test there. In Genesis, God's testing Jacob when he has Laban change his wages ten times. And in Exodus, God's testing Pharaoh's heart when he sends the ten plagues on all of Egypt. Well, in this passage, God, God turns the tables and asks his people to test him. See, most of the Bible, God's testing people. But here, he's calling for his people and for us to be testing God. Test me in this, he says. And what does he promise to those who test him? Through their tithing. God will throw open the floodgates of heaven and bless us abundantly. Now many people stop there. If we only read that passage, we come away thinking that the blessing that God gives is going to be financial. You may have heard this called the, the prosperity gospel or the give to get gospel. But that's not what God intends. If we look at the context of both this verse and other verses, we find that the blessing may not be just financial, but God will bless us in other ways. He may build healthy relationships into our lives. He may give us something that produces lasting joy and happiness for us. He may give us some creative ideas on how we can save money. I know it wasn't easy for me to start tithing when I started. See, I was living in New York City at the time and was paying nearly $1,000 a month to live in a tiny bedroom it was a three-bedroom apartment, but my bedroom didn't even have windows. And but God gave me some creative ideas to make it work. I would buy a bunch of extra Subway sandwiches and then eat them periodically throughout the week because you got a discount. Well, if you've ever had wilted lettuce and soggy <laughs> bread, yeah, God must have also known my taste buds. 
What's even more baffling is the peace and the contentment that comes with tithing. By developing this new level of trust in God, he frees us from the bondage of being selfish with or worrying about our money. You know, we know God doesn't need the money. He wants our hearts. But the best way to our hearts is through our finances. Jesus makes that point crystal clear in Matthew 6, where he says, For where your treasure is, your heart will be also. When we give first to him, he changes our selfish hearts into contented ones. Our desire to acquire is tamed, and we come away with a thankful heart, realizing all we have comes from God. So how are we supposed to give? For that, we turn to the New Testament in 2 Corinthians 9, verses 6 to 8. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. So this is telling us to give generously and cheerfully. God knows how easy it is for us to fall victim to the greed the world offers. There's literally constant temptation to buy things. Think for a moment how often you're invited to spend money. You got websites, commercials, you know, junk mail, magazines, and much more. God knows this and asks us to consciously think about where our money goes. Give what you have decided in your heart to give. He asks us to sow generously. Make it a spiritual decision. And note how the passage goes on. God will bless you abundantly, providing for all of your needs. God's again asking us to trust Him. All right, we know the Bible tells us to give our 10%. We're supposed to do it as an act of obedience, as a form of worship to God. We know we're supposed to consciously and cheerfully decide to do it. And then God will, tells us that He'll bless us in countless ways and will always provide for us. So I know tithing is something you want to be doing. And you know God wants you to be doing it. So why aren't we all doing it? Well, like most resolutions, they're hard to stick with. And with tithing, it's not easy to start doing. So the church is going to help you. The river is offering you a challenge, a tithe challenge. We believe strongly that if you will cheerfully test God by giving the first 10% of your income over the next three months, you will see God work in a whole new way in your life. Most of you have now received the challenge cards. Please take it out and take a look at it. The challenge will start next weekend and will run through April. If at the end of April you are not convinced of God's faithfulness to bless you as a result of your obedience to his word, you are entitled to a full refund of your contributions made during this time. Did you catch that? The church will refund all of your donations made during the challenge if you don't see God blessing you, God directly working in your life. No questions asked. Now, in order for you to stick to this, it may, may, it may mean making some changes in your life. Now, I'm not going to ask you to eat soggy bread, but maybe it means you make your coffee at home, and then you drive by Starbucks instead of driving through Starbucks. We've put together this packet of information that you can find at the info spot. It deals a little bit about budgeting and tracking expenses. So if you're all like me, you're probably thinking, wait a minute, you want me to start shelling out 10% of my hard-earned income and giving it here? Why here? That's a good question. Your, church, your giving enables the church through its ministries to change people's lives on both a physical and a spiritual level. Make no mistake, God has big plans for the river, both in this community and beyond. He's going to provide for us regardless of your individual giving. But we also have heard today and we know the blessings God gives you, the giver, when you trust him in every facet of your life. So why here? Well, why not here? God is partnering here. He's working here. We're partnering with us. Join him in that. 
Imagine what we could do as a church if everyone here accepted this challenge. How would God bless us when he opened the floodgates of heaven to us? We've doubled our attendance in just over a year. We trust God to provide, and he is providing. But if more of our members tested and trusted, just think how many more people we could reach in the community. We could give hope, freedom, and God to single mothers, to those who have lost their job, to those with no home, to those who face divorce, or bankruptcy, or addictions, to those who need hope the most. We could help you all grow closer to God. So if you're ready today, I invite you to fill out this form and turn it into the offering bucket. Then we'll contact you and help you get started. Or if you're not ready today, then take it home with you and pray about it. Talk about it with your family on what would need to change. Maybe meet with someone from our finance team. And then bring it back next week for the challenge kickoff. We're going to take a moment now for you to talk with God about what you've heard today. Ask Him to guide you in your finances. Ask Him to give you the courage and the confidence to stick to this challenge.